Okay, so here we are, Wednesday afternoon, and we're going to attempt to cover a couple of topics, uh, chapters 9 and 10 in our textbook. And as we're covering those, there's two, actually kind of two completely different uh, major topics that we want to talk about. Uh, chapter 9 is dealing with documents of communication. Uh, what actually, what uh, group one has been working on, um, you know, like email and memos and things like that in the workplace. And then chapter 10 is dealing with leadership and conflict management, which to me, that's one of the most important things. And so I'll probably spend quite a bit of time on chapter 10, but I don't want to undercut or undermine chapter nine either. So we're going to look at that a little bit. Um, several people have already submitted their uh, some professional documents online, and I'm going to look at those, hopefully not in a derogatory or negative way or in any way that will be embarrassing, but just kind of looking um, at them and comparatively uh, in order to um, draw some conclusions about how business documents should be used. All right. So with that, uh, let's dig right in. And our first business is in chapter nine, looking at business communication in written form. So business communication in written form can take several different methods. We use the word written kind of loosely these days because many times the written form has become so much digital. Even in the last three years, many, many companies have switched over from having handwritten documents to having, you know, uh, the Adobe Sign It uh, program where you can have a digitized copy of a handwritten form and then you can digitally sign things. You can digitally read them. You can digitally fill them out and resubmit. Now, that's been, uh, like I said, it's been in the works probably for 15 years, but I've noticed personally over the last three years, uh, an exponential increase in the use. And of course, uh, when everything was moved to digital and remote work this past year, that has been part of the impetus to really get digital forms of written documents as the primary means of communication. Obviously, some pros and cons to that, um, but I think one of the pros is that you have everything in one place. It seems to me that it's a little bit harder to lose documents that are um, that are digital, or let me say to misplace them. But the flip side of that is that it's much easier to electronically lose them, uh, you know, effectively, right? Where, like, you have a hard drive crash and everything on that, all the documents that are available on that are, you know, vanish into the bitosphere. So those are two different things. Easier to track digitally um so that's a that's a pro but then easier to for them to be uh annihilated lost 
um, decompose, whatever. And that's the con. Now, most, most of companies these days um, are currently, they have policies where if they're going to have digital documents, then they have to have a very robust system of backup. And they call this redundancy, right? Where you have more than one cop co copy of everything. In the olden days, the way redundancy worked was you have these layers of paper, a lot of times different colored sheets of paper, and between them, you would have like this inked surface, it's called carbon paper. And so when you took a piece of, uh, when you took a form and you took a ballpoint pen and filled it out on the top, the carbon would transcribe what you filled out on the top onto the second, third and fourth copies. And so uh, governments, businesses were able to produce documents, you know, in triplicate or in, in quadruplicate for the purpose of preserving. So the customer has a copy, the, um, the account manager, whoever is responsible for that customer has a copy, and then the archives have a copy, right? So everything had at least three copies that redundancy guaranteed that an important document didn't accidentally get thrown away and all copies lost. Uh, today, big cloud warehouses, uh, if you'll remember the, the fourth, uh, the group three presented on, uh, and particularly Turkivius presented on Microsoft, uh, cloud program called Azure, the Azure enterprise database. And they have a different kind of redundancy. And uh, database redundancy is basically where you, a database, a cloud platform is very similar in some ways to your laptop where you have a hard drive, right? except that a cloud has a building full of hard drives and particularly hard drives are allotted to particular um, clients. So for example, William Carey uses OneDrive and they use SharePoint, which is supplied by Microsoft. It's built on this Azure architecture, uh, I'm sure to some extent. The documents that you that you have and that you save in your OneDrive um, are somewhere on a particular hard drive that Microsoft Azure controls. But Microsoft Azure's hard drive system of cloud computing isn't satisfied that it only be on one hard drive, right? Every server, every, of every database that they have has at least one backup, if not more, right? And so everything is backed up in multiple places. So if one hard drive goes down, then they can replace that hard drive and bring back a copy of everything that was on there from their backup. And um, we on the front end that use OneDrive or Dropbox or Google Drive or whichever one it is, um, never see it. it. It's seamless, right? And they have built-in redundancy for the purpose of preserving and not losing communication. All right, so that's just a little bit of uh, the impo uh, an important strategy in 
using documents is making sure that there is a, a certain amount of redundancy in it. Let's talk about the format. Oh, we talked about a, a week, I guess it was a week and a half ago now. We talked about that professionalism in the construction of your documents, right? In your letters, in your email, in your texting. Um, but a lot of business communication also requires um, writing formal memos or and memos a lot of times have the force of policy for a company for example uh we at william carey we get emails from time to time and the emails outline uh for example an email from dr king goes out to all the faculty, all the staff, all the students, and anybody else on their mailing list. It can be for many different reasons, right? A week and a half ago, he sent out a memorandum uh, about Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, rem reminiscing about his, you know, his life, about his legacy, even the connection of him, you know, having traveled here to Hattiesburg and to uh, the the Mount Zion Church here a couple blocks away, uh, two weeks before he passed. That's a that's a formal presentation of culture, right? So going back to our original description of communication as culture, memoranda, the plural of memorandums, is, um, are formal communications that build a corporate culture, right? They, they tell the culture what is important, right? Um, it may be remembering, you know, it may be ritual, remembering holidays. It may be policy, right? This is the policy. You know, y'all have gotten many memoranda, uh, policy about how to react during COVID, about what you can and cannot do, about changes to rules, changes to handbook. I think we got a memorandum today about our new health clinic that just opened up and will be available when students move back on campus. Um, these are kinds of professional communications that build our culture, that, that, that create this cultural communicative layer that kind of blankets everyone in our, in our association, right, in our school. And so when you think about a memorandum, if you are, you know, not everyone can send out a memorandum, unfortunately, right? We had somebody attempt to do that, I believe, yeah, about three or four years ago. They'd gotten access to the mailing list and just sent out random uh, communications that went to all the faculty, staff, and students and inappropriate communication obviously the um the access to that actually got shut down huh, obviously within about 24 to 48 hours but you begin to see that the communication unfortunately or fortunately however you want to look at it has this hierarchical structure to it Right, that the communication um, starts at the top and then filters down. Um, there may be important things that need to be communicated, but it has to kind of filter up through the proper channels to um, to those nodes 
of authority. So let's talk about that for a minute. This idea of authority. This is, um, I think, a very important. Actually, I don't, I don't know if y'all can see that. Can y'all see that? Very light. Oh, we can. May need to move my camera up a little bit more. Okay, let's try this. Can you, if y'all can see um, the notepad clearly, can you let me know? I can't see it. How about the notepad? I can see Mr. Rogers. Okay, cool. Uh, that's why I just acquired this new little camera, the doc, docu-cam, and I think it's kind of cool. All right, so power. Power is this concept, and actually, I think it ties in with our communication right now. Um, we could talk, we could... Um, I've been in a whole class that just dealt with power and language, right? How communication is kind of the embodiment of power, right? Who gets to speak, when they get to speak, who has to listen, all those kinds of questions. Um, and it really is um, very appropriate to what we're talking about here today. And, um, Professional writing is about using your power effectively. Now, I know I may be using a slightly different word, but we actually talked about this um, earlier in our, our lecture series. But I talked about it more in terms of gifts. Right, how each person has particular gifts, and that gift tells them what their role is. Right, your gift equals your role. Part of your role in an organization is the amount of power you have to accomplish certain tasks. Right, power to accomplish tasks. All right, so usually this power is deployed to some degree, or it, um, I'm not going to say it's completely deployed, but it, a lot of it um, has a communicative layer, all right? has a communicative layer.
So when you're writing letters, business letters, when you're writing memoranda, um, when you're writing policy, right? When you're writing handbooks, um, perhaps uh, those of you that are in the speech and debate um, group know that we have a handbook. And actually, I, I um, wrote it, edited it after I came here to the school because there wasn't one in existence, or at least um, there hadn't been in a while. And so this handbook is a, a official communication that lays down some of the norms, practices, procedures that tell us how to act, how to behave, how to interact um, in within the roles of our um, uh, of each of our assignments, right? It also for you, um, if you are a member of the speech and debate team, it also gives you some guarantees of the kind of help that you can expect, the kind uh, you know, the kind of benefits that you should expect as a member of the team. So power kind of goes both ways, right? It's it's both a giving and a establishing of structure, but it's also a, a a social guarantee of some of some services, some benefits, etc. And so it's it's a, constructing these forms requires that you think through okay what is the extent of your power you know how far does it reach how far does it not reach right and of course for those who of us who are ambitious um we may try to over we may you know try or not we may overstep our boundaries and the community pushes back right um as a teacher i could overstep and then I have um, my bosses that step in. Well, that's not your prerogative. That's not your, um, you know, that's not within your purview to be able to accomplish, you know, to be able to speak to those particular things. And there's a division of services, division of uh, assignments, division of roles for that purpose. Okay. So. language our communication outlines and let me use another word here right it's negotiation it forms the basis of negotiation there we go it forms the basis of a uh, of a going back and forth trying to establish you know, who is responsible for what, when, how, and why. And so usually a, a business letter doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? It is a, it is um, instigated by some kind of a relationship. It's instigated by some kind of a transaction right between you as a client and um a business firm or between you as a business and your clients and so this transaction um is part of the creating of relationships um in order to supply the needs of the customer This idea of relationship, I think, is extremely important. Relationship almost always has to have a communicative aspect. We build relationship through communication. All right. So, um, as your formal introduction to communication, um, is your resume, 
right? And or and or cover letter. So that brings me to to this point here, and and we're going to take just a quick look. Like I said, I'm not trying to be um, ugly. Hopefully, this class is a safe space. Um, but I just wanted to um, just look at in a not at all judgmental, but just just take a look at some of the documents of um, of resumes and cover letters that have been uh, shared uh, for the purpose of, of fulfilling this assignment. Okay, so I'm gonna swap now to screen two. Hopefully you can see that. So this is um, an example that uh, Logan provided. She talks about some uh, some jobs she had before college and um, some activities she engaged in and her current job now. Uh, she outlines skills, so she, she, she has experience, she has skills. I think this is really important. Um, what do you see as your, like the things that you do, you want to do, you can do, right? So obviously your skill isn't going to be an exhaustive list of things that you want to do or that you can do. But again, it's going to be some things, right? Focus on the things that you most want to do, right? So your resume should be a communication, you know, if you're using your experience like me, I've got now um, 24, five, six years of experience. I'm not gonna write all 25 years on my resume. Um, because Basically because it's too much for one thing. But the other reason is my resume is should be targeted for a particular Thing. And so they're wanting to see what experience you has that relates to what you're what you're applying for. Right. Here's another example. Um, I'm going to pick on Gala since she's here. Um, I, I really liked this one. Um, the only thing I would do slightly differently. So she starts off with just a, you know, a cover page. Um, a lot of people in acting actually have like the whole eight by 10 first page is a headshot, right? Like the whole front page is a headshot. And then like, then they fit everything else that they can on the back of that eight by 10 headshot. And that's a lot of times. So casting, um, people in in uh, theater and television and things like that, if whenever they're wanting to cast for a role, they're going to basically have all these headshots laid out in front of them. And they're going to try to see, okay, this person, I feel like, you know, from their headshot, they could potentially have this kind of personality that would fit this role. Um, and so a lot of times, Unfortunately, what they see on that first five, you know, first 15 seconds of what they see on, uh, you know, in that headshot is what they're going to, what they're going to get based on. Then, you know, flip over on the backside and you see all that relevant information um, about what she calls basic information, you know, which unfortunately, again, as an actor, it's all about your body, your body type. Um, uh, and then, and then, thirdly, 
it's like all the other opportunities in education that she's had. So this is a great, honestly, this is a, a, a great resume for, for, um, for acting. And then uh, I think Omar's was somewhat similar. He used a, a resume generator, which is fine, absolutely fine. Um, has his you know name bold right at the top, kind of contact information, and then he uses a summary, right? What does he want to do? Um, and for him, the summary is about leadership, administrative, helping residents, um, proficient in professional speaking, problem solving, planning, mediation. Ooh, that's good, right? Problem solving, mediation. Um, that's leadership right there. Right. If, if someone is looking for leadership and that's what we're fixing to get into in our second second half hour, um, leadership is so much about finding ways of solving problems. And um, part of solving problems is dealing with people problems. Right. Mediation, conflict resolution. So, you know, that speaks very strongly. Public speaking, policy reinforcement. That's a good word, right? So he may not write all the policy, right? His supervisor may write the policy, but he makes sure he's one of those guys that makes sure that the policy gets followed, right? Ethical standards, you CPR certified problem solver, team building, communications and people skills. That, that's a, a great resume um, targeted for what he's looking at, right? Um, so those are some examples. Uh, let me, um, while I'm here, I'm just going to go ahead and show you one. Um, la like I, I may have mentioned to you all at the beginning of the semester um, last summer, I was looking at doing some contract work, some a little consulting work on linguistics um, and um, actually uh, writing software programs for linguistics. And so I have a resume. Um, based on that that I use, so I'm gonna I'm gonna bring that up right now. All right, new time now. There we go. And you know, let me say that. Unfortunately, there is no perfect resume. Um, you get on LinkedIn and you read and you're going to read 20 articles and each one is going to say something different. There's no and and in fact, at the same time that they're saying something different, they're all going to be um, complaining that the system of of people finding jobs and getting connected to work is broken. And so um, we're all about communication. We're all about thinking through, you know, what can we possibly do to improve? But it's just like going to a tournament and putting ourselves out there and, you know, presenting this, you know, this highly, this well thought through, composed, practiced, polished piece and then getting six. Right. Um, getting sixth place. There's so much ambiguity. There's so much um, um, bias, for lack of a better word. And there's nothing we can do about bias. We all have bias. Um, so hopefully the goal is um, to use these tools, right? This isn't the end all be all. This is a tool. It's to communicate and it's to try to tell a story to someone and find that audience that that audience that is interested in the story. Right. So it's a it's a just a tool for connecting two people to be able to enter into a relationship and get work done together. All right. So this is this was my resume data mining, language processing and linguistics. I have uh, experience over the last 15 years been solving interesting problems for internal external customers. So basically I have my, um, just like Omar, I have the, you know, the, my synopsis, my overview 
you're at the very top. Contact information, email, phone, and um, for my particular thing, GitHub is where most computer software developers meet. It's on a on a website called GitHub, and then of course I have my LinkedIn um, profile, which people can go to and see a much more extensive list of experiences uh, for that. You know, I have my languages, I have programming languages that I've worked on, and then my key skills, program management, leadership development, strategic planning, and then some uh, additional hashtags, which is kind of like um, tools that I know how to use, I guess. I don't know exactly how to distinguish on um, this. I, I've, I've seen it used, and so I tried it. Like I said, I've probably got um, 20 different resumes. This is one that I use most recently. Um, again, I've gotten some work with some resumes and no work with a lot of other resumes. <laughs> and so it's, it's not a perfect silence, right? It's, it's merely a tool of communication, hopefully. Um, I've gotten nibbles with this resume um, for some contract work that I wanted to do. So hopefully we, I will again. Anyway, so that just gives you an idea of the kinds of the kinds of documents, you know, to communicate, to um, to establish kind of our role and what we're looking for. Now. The resume is your initial segue into this role, right? What does the company come back with? The company comes back with their job description, right? Okay, how close does your resume meet the job description, right? It's not going to be 100% match, right? I mean, that hardly ever exists in, in the real world. If it's a 90% match, that's awesome, right? A lot of companies are very happy with an 80% match, even a 70% match. Okay, so that's where the negotiation takes place, and that's where the interviews happen, right? First, the phone interview, and then an in-person interview, and then if they really like you, then they come back and let you meet all the team, and through those processes, you have this negotiation back and forth um, well, this is what I can do. This is what I want to do. And then where it comes down to, this is what I'm willing to do, right? Whereas they, this is what we need done. Oh, sorry. This is what we, you know, ideally what we'd love to get done. This is what we want done. And then ultimately it comes down to, well, at least we need this done. And so between the two of y'all, or you know the two group groups coming together, negotiating, coming to an understanding. Okay, this is what your and so then your your job description or your uh, job profile will be um, a negotiated list of bullet points. You know, and it needs to be in writing, right? Whenever they give you an offer of a job they're going to ask you to kind of sign off on, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. Or, or rather, I am willing to do this, 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 and this, right? Um, if you're not willing to do something, you, that needs to be marked off, right, and negotiated before you sign on the dotted line. Obviously, we, um, we zoom right to the end, we see the dollar signs, um, and we're willing to sign. And I mean, that's part of it, right? We've got to live, we got to make money, we got to make a living. So um, that, there's no shame in that for sure. But it, it, it is important um, on the one hand to a little bit stand up for yourself on what you want, but on the other hand, be also gracious and willing to accept, you know, in order to get work, sometimes you, you have to do something. Don't do something that's unethical. Don't do something that is extremely inconvenient. Have some personal boundaries and say, hey, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm, 
I, you know, I won't do X, Y, and Z, right? And be realistic about that. Um, you know, again, be ethical about that. But um, you have to kind of think through, why don't I want to do this? Um, is it a matter of pride? Is it a matter of necessity? Is it a matter of personal health, right? Including mental health. The, the, you know, those things have to come into play when you're negotiating. And so these legal, these business documents, in a sense, are almost legal documents because they are the terms within which we have to conduct our business and we have to conduct our lives. So be mindful of that as we develop. Um, and then when, once you have this role, then you're going to um be developing documents that uh you're going to be developing documents that are, are are communicating the authority and power that they have that the company has vested in you right Let's see so the company is going to vest in you your authority. And so within this role, let's com come back to our uh, writing pad here. Sorry. Um, within this, your role, they're going to invest a certain amount of power and you're going to communicate that power through your written documents, right? Through letters, through memoranda, you know, as part of the node um, of the administrative, um, you know, the administration's. Oh, let me let me draw it out here for you. Right, you have the president, CEO, whatever, here at the top. You have um, different VPs uh, for different, uh, for admin, for education, for finance, money, etc. In a school like William Carey, you have, you know, Dr. King, you have the different schools or, um, you know, you have English for us. We have the theater and communication. Uh, and that's uh, Mr. Tim. Under him, so he's theater, right? And under Com, you have Dr. Knight. And then under that, you have speech and debate coach. And then under that, you know, then I have, so I can't write policy for the theater and, and debate um, school. Now I can communicate and say, hey, we need this, we need that. And Mr. Tim and Mr. N and Dr. Knight are, are excellent listeners. And they'll take a look at it. They'll go back and talk to um, the School of Liberal Arts, or sorry, the School of Arts and Sciences, um, and the other deans. And you know, they'll sit through meetings and they'll talk about it. And then if, if that's something that they need, then they can implement it from their level and then send it back down through the structure, right? But I do, to a certain extent, make policy and, you know, day-to-day -day running decisions on, um, you know, what tournaments we go to and how we're going to get there and where we're going to eat lunch um, and, and things like that, right? And uh, again, I'm at the same time, I can listen to those under me and, you know, whenever they want to go to, um, what was it? They want to go to... Uh, the Mexican restaurant instead of the Italian restaurant, right? And we can we can we can make that change. We can uh, establish those those types of things. Anyway, you get my point. My point is, um, 
power is, you know, tends to go downward and communication tends to go downward a lot of time. There needs to be a upward mobility of communication, but it doesn't always happen that way, right? Um, authoritative communication, and communication is power because it kind of puts into words the, the policy, the way things are going to happen, the way things are run, uh, and so on and so forth. All right, so that kind of leads us right into chapter 10. Uh, and I know some of this is, kind of bleeds over into chapter 10. Um, but chapter 10 is talking with leadership, right? And I, I think it, it's intrinsic in this idea of role and power and understanding how power works. And... Um, Let me see here. I'm, I'm going to bring something up real quick. I can find it. I'm, I'm pulling up another... Um, document here real quick if I can locate it um, without too much wasted time and I know time is passing on I've already spent uh, almost 50 minutes just on chapter 9 I didn't intend to do that it's all right we will we will do what we got to do I can't find it. Well, that's a bummer. All right. Well, I'm not going to worry about it then. Um, so, leadership, um, I've hinted at it. We've looked at it, We've um, and, and even looking at some of the resumes and the communication that we've talked about, we've been hinting at it, but I want to make it explicit now that leadership is about building community. Okay, I, um, that's what the book says, and I agree with this. 110%. Okay. Leadership equals building community. I think this is one of the most, the most powerful ideas with, in which we uh, have to deal with. Goes back to my very foundational um, understanding of communication that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and God said, right? God built everything by through his communication, right? Through his words. And then he gave us, man, the ability to communicate, to speak, to say, 
And through giving us the ability to speak and to say, we can enter into his work, right? And in entering into his work, and um, we could become part of his kingdom and actually help build the kingdom through communication. And I think that the form that the kingdom takes is community. Um, hopefully, um, you all agree with that. Now, unfortunately, because of the entrance of sin, um, community has different, uh, has been divided in order to resist the totalitarian encroachment of, of sin. All right. So we have different communities kind of competing or, if you will, holding a system of checks and balances um, in or, for our protection. So we have the community of our family, right? We have the community of churches, and we have the community of our government. But at the beginning, those all three were consolidated in one power, right? The power of the Father was both the power of the family and the power of the government and the power of religion. But over time, after the flood of Noah, um, those, those powers became very, um, very selfish, very, uh, what's the word, very overweening, and they had to be limited through division of power. And we even see that the, those kinds of principles at work in our own government um, for the purpose of prevention of too much power. Right. So um, the father lost some of his governing power. Right. And we um, now create. Um, positions of power through um, through the consent of the governed, right? Through through um, democratic process, in order to um, in order to mitigate that overweening, that overbearing use of power um, for evil that could have that could affect our lives. Um, religion, right? Our understanding of right and wrong, our understanding of life and death is probably the most powerful power in the world. And, um, we see that, right? Um, I think that's one of the reasons why it, it has been susceptible to the most abuse, right? It's, we place so much trust in people who speak to us about life and death, who have some, you know, who we um, think or kind of vest with some kind of knowledge and authority um, uh, of the afterlife that, you know, implicitly we have to trust them to a certain extent and then that trust kind of opens up this door for you know unfortunately within the um within the evil of man to take advantage of that trust you know and to it and to um exploit certain vulnerabilities and we see that i mean most of the major religions right now are really struggling with, um, you know, sexual predation um, because of the amount of uh, the amount of power, the amount of authority um, granted them, you know, over people's lives, you know without that limiting of power and without that holding them accountable, uh, 
the 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 power would just um, be too much, and it would be used for personal um, personal gain, you know, and very destructive habits. So that kind of gives us a picture of power, right? Both the the dark side as well as the light side of power, right? We all have power. And um, as individuals, through the democratic process, we tend to share back part of that power in towards the people who we vest with these kind of positions of authority over us, right? So from my perspective in our denomination, you know, the ideal is that the... Um, that the the preacher, the pastor, the bishop, whoever it is, um, is given vested power um, by the people you know who elect him as the pastor. Uh, I know in the Southern Baptist churches, uh, we usually have the right you know to elect our pastors. Now there, I understand, and this is where it gets tricky. I understand from a theological standpoint that all power is vested in God and that God um, in a sense distributes it as he sees fit. I also understand that all evil hasn't been taken out of the picture yet, right? We are in this stretch of eternity that we call time and it is kind of this trying um segment in which we are are given you know it's kind of this sandbox experience that we are given opportunities and we're given choices and so real choices in order to matter have to have real consequences and so we have this period you know before the eternal hereafter and anyway i i know i'm kind of uh, getting off into a lot of philosophical things, but kind of keeping this perspective of how power works and, and where it comes from, and then um, from a practical standpoint that, you know, God gives us personal power. Well, at the same time, we acknowledge that God is all-powerful. We also acknowledge, uh, you know, as Christians, personally, I, as a Christian, I believe that every person has the right to stand before God, right, on their own. And we call this the priesthood of believers, that all believers have a standing before God, you know, flat-footed, on an even keel with everyone else. There are, you know, ultimately no pe people above us that um, can intermediate for us, um, and that's that. Um, that's the ultimate. So when we when we elect people in our communities to stand for us and stand with us and administer certain roles in in our religion, then that is a limited amount of power. They need to perceive that. We need to perceive that, and we need to perceive that we have a role in um, holding them accountable. The same thing with government, right? Government isn't all-encompassing. It's limited. They derive their power from the consent of the governed, as it says in our Constitution, right? So in a sense, while God, you know, we know from Romans 13, all governments are instituted by God, yet God has vested those governments with power through the democratic process. And in our case, you know, we elect our, our, our um, officials, whether or not our elections, you know, anyway, I'm not going to even go there. Um, so power is limited 
And in a sense, it is communicated both ways, right? We communicate to them and we, um, we take of our power and give to those in authority over us. And, you know, the same thing will be true in any business or any job that you get, right? You, by hiring on, you are giving them authority over your time, right? From the time you clock in, the time you clock out within the terms of that job description, you're giving him, you know, you're giving your boss authority over you. Um, he doesn't have ultimate authority over you, right? He only has as much authority as you allow him to have that y'all have negotiated together for. And you have that same authority to take that authority back, right? And walk out. Fortunately, we live in Mississippi and it's called the right to work state, right? You can quit your job for any reason or for no reason. And there's, there's not really anything um, that, you know, that the, that the company can do against you for that, which is, a, you know, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse. There's no guarantees, but there's also this liberty, right? This sense of liberty. So there are norms, right? Um, you know, if I was to quit um, under the norm, under the conditions of my contract at school, I'm supposed to give them 30 days notice. Now, you know, they can't really do anything to me if I walk out, you know, from day one, from one, one day to the next and not come back. But, you know, I will have broken some trust there, even though they, you know, they legally can't do anything to me. I would have broken some trust there and I would have fractured uh, some community that we had there in that school. And so those are, um, you know, those are things that we have to take in, into consideration. So leadership is about building communication. Um, and th this is this is just so phenomenal to me. I'm going to um, I am going to share this with you. And this is just a, a scripture that we were looking at uh, on Sunday at our church. And you all may um, recognize it. But it's Galatians chapter five. I said that God created everything by his word. God is a social God. He builds community. God is love. Love is the kind of the adhesive that holds community together. And so Galatians 5, 13 is about building community. And honestly, the um it basically all it's doing is bringing in oh sorry this is the bull gate um it it's literally bringing in the um a citation from the law of moses that shows um that shows that um that the law of Moses was for community building, right? Um, so many, uh, so many policy that are are popular in business today um, are just common sense things that go back to the law of Moses and and that God put into the system in order to take care of people, to protect them, keep them from being um, unduly harmed. Um. Galatians 5.13, for you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you'll love your neighbor as yourself, right? You know, we could build the whole context. Um, when, when somebody asked Jesus, who's my neighbor, right? Who did he, what did he tell? He told the story of the Samaritan, the guy who went, and saw the guy who was hurt and helped him up, um, took care of his wounds. There were other people who passed by and didn't engage, didn't interact with this guy. Um, they weren't being neighborly. That didn't mean they didn't have that responsibility. They did, but they didn't 
um, they didn't actively um, build their community, rather they, they, they tore it down. So the law, especially the second half of the law, is all about building community, right? You shall not steal, you shall not kill. You know, those two kinds of things break trust, they destroy the act of building community, right? Don't bear false witness. If, you, if people can't trust what you say, how can you build community, right? In business, you got to not steal, right? You got to not take advantage of people financially. You got to not take advantage of people's trust. You know, tell them what's right. Tell them what's true. Um, and you and and you don't definitely don't want to um, harm them physically, right? Don't kill them. Uh, either through your business practices, you know, through working them, overworking them, or you know, whatever, whatever we. All these laws come back to seeing others as valuable, taking care of others, and building community together with them. Right? Verse fifteen. If you bite and devour one another watch out that you're not consumed one of another but i say walk by the spirit you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit so um this kind of goes back to our understanding of power right there is the ideal there's the truth that calls us that that has legitimate power but then there's this flesh this dark side of humanity that constantly attempts to uh, subvert power for its own purposes and thereby is literally the cause of the disintegration of society, the cause of the disintegration of community. And these things are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want. Your real freedom as a person as a person, as a society, as a person in society, as a person at your job, as a person in your family, your real freedom is to live according to the law. The law isn't for stifling you. The law is for giving you freedom to actually fulfill your destiny, right? To fulfill your role, to, to fully execute the power that has been vested in you as a person. As a person before God, as a person in your society, as a person in your in your church, you know, and in, in every other sense and every other relationship that you have. If you're led by the spirit, you're not under law. And then he goes through and outlines, you know, all these things are kind of go against and and break down the fabric of community. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, and so on. Whereas the spirit is all about building community, right? What is community first built on? Love. The spirit of the spirit is love, right? Love doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's not a feeling that comes. It is about make forming relationships in which there is mutual appreciation, mutual support, and mutual building of community, right? For the joy, you're willing to take on some, um, some roles in, in, for a joy of serving others, right? And through that, then you're actively building a peace. Uh, I, I know that we're out of time. Uh, let me just say one word about peace. Um, going back to the to the scripture, going back to um, the uh, religion in our our denomination, we believe one of the one of the fundamental um, texts on which the church is built was on uh, conflict resolution. Okay, conflict resolution. Um, the second time that the, even the word church shows up in the Bible is here in Matthew 18, and it talks about um, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. Right? Building peace, creating peace, generating peace. 
If he doesn't listen to you, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So what is this? This is conflict resolution. It's a known fact that when you build community, the more people you bring together under one vision, the more um, conflict potential you have. And so conflict resolution is part of that, you know, jumping over hurdles, removing obstacles from community working together. It's not always possible, right? And in the end, if he, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen to the church, then let him be as what? Um, an illegal immigrant. As someone outside, someone away, the other, right? Someone outside of the nation of Israel, someone outside of our community, someone that, uh, you know, that we don't have any trust in, that we know takes advantage of us. That's what these, they're using these pejorative labels for someone who will not cooperate in community with us. So after you've done everything you can to re resolve the conflict, at some point you just have to walk away and say, okay, I've done everything I can. And um, God's gonna have to be the ultimate judge on that, on that. But verse 20 says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. That is the the basic foundation stone of all community right there, right? Two or three gathered in the name of Jesus, whether for work, for worship, for family, for government, you know, ultimately they can build community together. All right, that's all I have. Um, thank you all for hanging out till the very end. Uh, this lecture will go up in a little while. Are there any questions? All right. Y'all have a great Wednesday. Stay safe. Be ready for the tournament this weekend, and we will see y'all. Well, sometime Friday. Bye, 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 Bye Carla. <laughs>